Hey everyone, it's uh, Joe Glines here uh, from The Automator, and today uh, Jackie Shook, unfortunately he's on vacation, uh, I'll, I'll have a little more on that here in a minute, but uh, Isaiah will help me out running the webinar if we, we have problems and stuff, so Isaiah, keep your eye on the, the chat if I'm talking right and vice versa, because I know John, John's done a webinar too, and it's like when you're doing it all by yourself, whew, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it is. So anyway, welcome everyone, hopefully I, I see a few new faces, but a lot of people, and Dylan, you made it to a webinar, dude, like I'm... I was joking with him because him, him and I talk pretty regularly, but um, he had never made it actually to a webinar. So now he can say he's made it to a webinar. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's let's uh, let's go ahead and get going here. The stupid Zoom bar is right in my way, and I can't move it off the screen. But oh, okay, that's weird. Um, so we had 110 registrants. Now you know most people just register so they can get the links and resources after, which is perfectly fine because we know this is a worldwide thing. Um, it's kind of funny, you know, that's one of the great powers of the, the internet and showing how the world, you know, even when you're niche, which I wouldn't, auto hockey shouldn't be that as niche as it is, right? It should be much more used. However, yeah. it is very niche, uh, but hey, you know, when we open up to the planet, we get a lot of people interested. So um, you do start off muted or should be started off muted. And if you have a question, you know, uh, you can either raise your hand um, or ask it in the chat, which as I said, are going to be trying to monitor um, or, you know, unmute yourself if you want. It's just when too many people try to speak at the same time, it, it becomes mayhem and very hard to follow. So that's why we start off uh, with, with people muted. Let's get going. So um, the last three episodes we did, um, were, were pretty interesting. I think the seven ways to identify what to automate was, was pretty interesting. And then we had a couple things of, you know, what you should include with your code and what you should never include with your code. So those were some, some really good fun things to talk through and think about of planning ahead. And, and if you're like me, um, often you do stuff and then you share it. And then as an afterthought, you're like, well, crap, I should have done several other things, right? So having a checklist, which is one thing Isaiah and I are, are working, he's developed a script object to go across all of our stuff, which is really cool. And then you can just make my, minute changes to that object and have everything work and not have to test it so much every time, right? So um, yeah, that, that's a good one. As I mentioned, Jackie's on vacation. Um, now he did, and, and I told Isaiah, I wish I had thought about it earlier because I would have done some Photoshopping <laughs> if I had planned ahead. But he, he's, uh, he's in Denmark right now out on this farm, he said, so here, here are a few pictures. He's out on the farm. Um, he's like, yeah, there's really no Wi-Fi or internet or you know electricity apparently. Um, oh my god! He said they're cooking, they're cooking on the fires, you know, and feeding animals and stuff. He has two young kids, so he, you know, I'm sure they're having a great time. So I asked him for a few pictures. Um, I thought we could have put him in an office here and, and you know photoshopped him in, <laughs> but um, it does. It, it's, it's, I, I love seeing pictures of, of things around the country, uh, different the, the planet right it's really cool to, to get this but i told him like this looks right out of my backyard almost um, you know, <laughs> like i'm on vacation uh, but let me take some pictures out of your backyard just before i go so right, if you right. ask for it let me send right. you those right <laughs> yeah. um so now let's move along here so this script and uh it's something isaiah and i I had wanted to do for quite a while. Um, I had a template and I forget actually who even the original author was, but we borrowed from, but then we tweaked it so much. We basically rewrote, well, I shouldn't say we, Isaiah is doing all the work, right? Um, I, but I, I'm, I come up with some of the painful ideas and he's like, oh God, Joe. Um, but, um, it's pretty cool. So like it, it, the trigger, the default trigger, which you can change is Alt S. So I'm gonna hit Alt S to, uh, to bring it up. Oops. Now, do you have it running? <laughs> is it running oh but you know what um we i don't know change if, the hotkey yet right yeah because this was the yeah control yeah, yeah. so we, right. we could just change it because i was telling him um there we go the alt s required two hand for me two hands um because usually it's my yeah. left hand that's doing this and so we changed it so anyway what's cool is it looks across all of your running auto hotkey scripts um, and you can come in here and choose if you want to filter it by script you can filter it by, hey, I want to look for hot keys or hot strings, or you can just start typing and say, look, let's say wrap. And as you type, right, it filters down to to only allow what's, you know, certain things that are visible that match it. The, this is, 
So that was the first part of like, hey, this would be pretty cool, right? Because often people forget the hot key or hot string that they use, right? Um, but I said, hey, you know, this is the one that it took us a little while to figure out, right? Was what if, let's actually, let's clear this up. Let's see if I have any that aren't, and you can, you can sort. So here's some that don't have um, a label, a description, right? Now, actually that, oh, that's interesting because that's my, so let's go to here, go to preferences. That is the spell check, which I don't, I don't want this on the spell check, right? So I'm going to save that, reload it. Um, because that has what, like 4,000 words and, yeah. and I don't want to use those in here, right? Um, but there are some here, I was hoping there were some that didn't have. I do have some, I do have some examples Here's, for that. Oh, this one, yeah. Ironically, this is the hotkey I have that launches this script that I didn't actually <laughs> update yet. But here's yeah. the, to me, really, really wicked cool part. You could double click it and it will pop open in your default editor and jump to, look at that, it jumped to the line where it is. So no matter what your default editor is, we did a couple custom things for Studio, for anything with Scintilla, so Notepad++ and Sight um, and, and whatever else like that, and then for VS Code. Um, and if it's not that, we took a different approach, so that way even like in Notepad, it should still work. Um, but at least it gets you to the correct line. It doesn't right. highlight it, but yeah, it takes you right. there. Um, now, what, what's cool is here, uh, I'm gonna do an inline comment and say, you know, launches, HK hot string helper and save that. Um, now actually I have to reload that or no, it reads the file, right? As I, so I don't actually have yeah, to reload this. It, it reads the file, but yeah. it, you, re, you reload the script though. Yes. Yeah, so the script should be reloaded, I think for it to reread the, the file. And now it is. Yeah. And now there. let's say help. Huh. Yeah, there it is. No, that's not the one. I, I'm not how sure. You, how did on. you? Yeah, well, before I just sorted on it, so I didn't really pay attention. All oh, right. So, oh, yeah. But it's the cups. Let's do the um, control H. Launch or just just type the word launch. Yeah. Uh, why isn't it? Uh, that's interesting. But you know what? Let's go ahead. Let's make sure. I mean, let me reload that one. It, it should have saved it, though. It. Oh, right. Yeah. I understand what you mean now. Yeah, but that one, so why? It should read the file itself, not, right. not, yeah, not it's much. not the reading, not, it's not the one that is running, it's just the file, whatever it is there. So yeah, say okay. So we're we obviously may, maybe have a, still a few things to, to work out on this, um, but yeah, I don't know. It, I don't know, it's not there. Anyway, we'll, we'll figure that part out. Um, yeah. But uh, another interesting thing is you could, you can, let's say you have a hotkey that, granted this is in its own script, right? And this is the one, if you saw the video where we were like trying to disable a hotkey remotely and make sure it's like, we'll just basically create one in this script and then it will, it'll take over. So that's how we implement this. We could right click and say disable. And now it's gonna disable control M in that other script until we quit this script. And that's why when you exit it's, oh, that's not an exit, is it? That just closes the GUI. Um, so if I exit, it says, hey, when you exit, the things that you canceled out are now going to be active again, because we didn't actually cancel them out, right? We just hit them. I'm trying to think of mask them, maybe the better no, way. So what we're doing is just kind of hijacking it. So whatever, yeah. whatever other hot uh, script is actually having that particular hotkey, now we just grabbed it for our script and we're saying like, no, it will not do anything for now. But um, in general, the main idea um, with this script is that it reads all the hot keys and hot strings that you have in any open script, whatever is running right now on your computer. So you could go ahead and uh, either if you don't remember what the hot key was or what it does, you could go ahead and um, see it very quickly. Now, what I'm uh, kind of like wondering, I think, you know, can you can you just remove the text and and try to sort it out again? I am. I think the the comment is not being read. Oh, hold on. This is why it's not because we didn't 
Oh, you're not launching the correct one. Yeah, that's why. No, well, no, that was, it's the right folder. No, but can you click where it says filter by file and see if it is listed there? Out of hotkey. Oh, so that's the one that has it. Just click on that one, right? Click on filter by hotkeys only. Filter by hotkeys only. And where it says filter by type, just click on that one. Well, here on the top yeah so oh the thing is that there's kind of like a delay in there now yep. in that case where is control h i'm that's the one that we're looking for right yeah but um we'll, we'll figure it out right obviously there's something a little haywire at the moment but um yeah i'm not overly worried about it the, the, oh you got muted isaiah you're, you're muted <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. So I was just gonna say, like, I, I'm not understanding exactly what happened there, but um, the the cool thing about this particular script, and when we figure out, especially what is going on, it seems to me that it is not reading that hotkey specifically that one, because it, all the others are being read. But um, the cool thing is that it allows you to either, if you forgot what the hotkey was or what it does, you can add a label to that hotkey by using an inline comment. So you right. just put a comment right next to it or before it, I think. Um, you could do both, I think. But um, it would get you to understand what is going on um, very quickly. Now, in this case, I'm not really sure what happened there, but we will take yeah, a look I'll at it. it. We are actually in development, but it is a very interesting script to, to play with. If you have a lot of scripts running and sometimes you forget what the hotkeys they use yeah. are. Now, a couple other things that we're we're adding to this right now, like I said, this is a perfect the the letters like it has to be removes or R E M O V right. But we're going to change it to be more of a fuzzy match, right? So it'll be a little more flexible. So that way, if you happen to mistype or not know the exact name, you get the letters right. You can yes, help filter right. on it. Um, and then the second one is right now you can disable a hot key, but we're going to try to make it where you can disable a hot string as well. Um, yes, but we didn't we haven't uh, approached that one yet. Does anyone have any questions on anything? So we'll search across, descriptions borrowed. Yeah. And what's cool is, like I said, if you look in my main script, it borrows what is to the right. You know, so if if you go and add it there, it'll automatically read it those in, right? So and let's say like you didn't do that, um, it because you can just double click here and edit it, it it's so fast to update these, you know, when you find something you didn't do, you don't have to go hunt it down. You can just double click. It opens it in your script, add your dot, your comment or your description, and you're good to go. Oh, th that's the thing we should clarify. So right now we have hot keys. Let's do hot strings. So on a hot string, you know, this is your abbreviation like type thing, there, the trigger. There's how they lay. Oh, there we go. Now, now yeah. we can see. Then there's the, um, you know, the, the string that's good. The replacement is going to be the description. Right, because we figured that's what made the most sense. So yeah, so let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, I don't see any in the chat at the moment, but yeah. Other than it, does the farm use auto hotkey? Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll confirm that. <laughs> but we'll we'll work on that little bug before we. Uh, I'd say before you download it, let's figure we'll figure out that one. Oh, crap! Did I? Oh, I did hit record. Good. Sorry. I thought I forgot to hit yeah. record. Um, I still have a GUI tab question. Okay. So what would that be? Let me yeah, see if I can help. You. Yeah. Dimitri, can you unmute? You can unmute yourself if you want. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm currently working on a GUI and it's resizable. And uh, I want to make it work. So if you make it smaller, then it becomes more compact and it starts using tabs. Okay, so I have already prepared something that works kind of the way that I want to do it, but it uses a trick. I can show you, uh, share screen. So this is my GUI. And if you resize it, you see that the, the tab. 
I'm sorry, can, are you sharing the screen? Because I don't see it. Yeah. Okay. There you oh, go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So this is my GUI. And if you resize this, you see that the tap control resizes with the height. And if you make it smaller, I want to have that the edits control jumps to the to a new tab. Okay, so yes. So okay. um, what I did now was kind of cheating <laughs> because um, I used two edit controls okay. and I hide and unhide the one. And also if you type in one, it will copy it to the other the one. Other. Yep. So that is actually the way I want to have that it works, but it would be way easier that you could just move that control to Inside. the new tab. Yes. So that is my question, if that, mm -hmm. that is possible. Actually, no. Um, <laughs> as far as I understand, after you create a, a, a tab control, you can add controls to it, but you cannot move a control to it. I have, I, I'm not really sure about it. And this, and this uh, workaround that you have is more common than you think. For example, in the script that we were just looking at, the 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 uh, one with the hotkeys that, yeah, the the yeah the lookup look that yeah the lookup script that we, we were just call it at. something different so we're right <laughs> we're getting used to it but on that one you don't notice but i am using two different list views when you start typing to search for something i show a different list view that is just going to show the results and when you finish typing and you remove whatever you were searching for i just display the original uh, uh, list view. So that trick of just hiding and showing the same control or a different control is more common that you, than you think in GUIs because moving the control is more expensive than just hiding and showing one. So I, your solution is exactly what, what I would have done myself as well. And um, and if I remember correctly, there is no current way to move an existing control inside an existing tab. I know that you can add a new control to a tab or just hide it and show it, but you cannot move a control inside it. Okay, then I have another question. Is it possible to uh, put the control on top of the tab control, but not part of the tab control? Because you, you could say if, if you press here, um, if you press four, that he will show an edit that is not part of the tab control, but is part of the GUI and it's on top of the tab control. What you and if you might press try. another tab, then it will trigger a uh, script and that will cause it to hide it because you see uh, the tab is not test. So I must hide this control. Yes. That would be another solution. And I would prefer to use that because then you just have one control because I want to also add um, events yeah. to that control and maybe mm -hmm. use a list view. And you can imagine that it becomes quite harder to mimic a list view yes. that way. Well, but mm, not really. But in, in any case, what I'm thinking right now, and I just thought of something that might work. I'm, I have never done it myself, but you know that um, when you're creating windows, you can select what the parent window is, right? So you, you have this option of selecting a parent window, right? Yes. Now, when you do that, especially, um, you would have to do it via, the reason why I said it's not possible, I would have, I meant not possible without a hotkey commands. But if you use DLL calls to create the control and you can actually set up the parent for that control, then yes, you might be able to move that control and actually change who the parent is. Um, let me double check if GUI control has the option to change the parent. Because if you can, then I think that's the solution to it. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at GUI control. And in the options, I think you can set up the parent. So we control. I actually, um, I think I tried to do something similar. 
uh, DLL call set parents. And right. then I would guess that I need to have the uh, ID of the, the tab. And yes, the handle the of the tab. ID of the edits. Now, here's the thing. So th there's two things that you have to do. First of all, you have to set up the parent. And I think um, now that I'm looking at the GUI control, um, I, I was just remembering that they added the option that you could put options to a control. So you can change the tab. Let me show my screen real quick so you could um, understand a little bit more of what I'm talking about. So only just one second. So can you see my screen right now? Uh, no, I, I I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. Then maybe you. Yeah. Okay. So here with the GUI control command, you could set options to an existing control, which is what I was not sure if we could do. And I said that no, it was not possible. But yes, it is possible because this this in here was not available when I started coding. So this is new. Now you could just go ahead and put plus parent and put the handle of the tab. But after you do that, you would have to move the control to the location that you want. So you would have to first set up the parent here, then move the control. And probably, I think one of the things that I'm not really sure about is whether you can change the Z order of, an, of a control. Because a Z order tells you which one is on top of which one, okay? So that is one that I'm not really sure. Again, that's the reason why I say that with uh, auto hotkey commands is not doable because there's a few things that are not readily available. I think if we use the, uh, I don't think that the Z order that we can find in here is about when you use tab, uh, alt tab. So that's not what I'm talking about. <coughs> I'm sorry. So I would have to double check um, if it is possible with our hotkey commands but I am definitely sure that you can do that with DLL calls. You have to first change the parent, you have to change the location of the control, and then you have to verify if you can change the order, the, the, the Z location, which one goes on top of which one. I think when you set the parent, and I think you also have to change the window settings to be clipping window. There's a few little things that you have to take into consideration, okay? And so let me show you what I'm talking about. We here, um, you have the styles and options for a, the styles and options for a window. Where are they? Haven't used this in a long time. So this is options for a control, styles for a window. Window appearance, probably. No. Styles. I remember seeing the stuff with styles and going, "Yeah, I, I don't need to know any of that stuff." Uh, yeah, but but it is. This is this uncommon styles and options. In here, there is. You see these these variables like client edge styles and so on. In here, we have it for controls. I don't. I I I think you have worked with this before, right? Now these options. You can set them in the options of the control by using the plus to add them or minus to remove okay. them, okay? So one of those like clip siblings and those kind of things are the ones that you're gonna be using for the control. And that tells you one, a particular child window does cert receive some messages and stuff. You have to, I think uh, when you create, uh, here we go, we have the overlapped window. Um, you do not want an overlapped window because that's the main window. You have to remove that. And there's a lot of little details that you have to add and remove to make sure that after you make it as a child of the tab, it's gonna be displayed correctly on top of the tab. Now you can do that with DLL calls for sure. I can tell you that you can do with DLL calls. Or, and this is something that I would have to actually just double check with the GUI control command, I think you can do that. So the GUI control command, it allows you to add the options and in the options you would use the plus and minus signs 
with those styles and um, settings for a control. So you would use this guy here, you know, for the options. That's what you would do. And in here with the plus and minus, you would put the styles that I'm talking about and set that control to be a child of the tab. That's my best guess as what you can do with that. I, I tried to do uh, the plus parents and then the, the ID of the uh, mm -hmm. tab. But Mike, um, if you create a tab, um, how do you define the different tabs? Because, because you can define what the ideas of the control. Yes. But then you ha have not defined yet. Yeah, again, this is why I, you are making a very good question. You're asking a very good question because this is the part where I would say, yes, there is a way because actually each of the tabs is kind of like a button and each button sends a message. Um, and basically, again, that's why I would go with the DLL route because you will have access to all of that. Another trick that you can use instead of going the DLL call route would be capturing the messages. You see, when you click the tabs, you just capture what message that is and you would get more information about the tab that actually sent the message. And that way you could actually just make the control hide and show, uh, but you would have to do it manually. What I'm saying is like, there is no easy way for you to just grab a control, put it inside a tab and it's gonna work. No, you would have to do it manually. And that's the reason why I said, the trick that you're doing is way more common than you think. It's not, it's not like a trick. That's the way to do it. Like that's, that's easier. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it would seem way more easier just to move it then you have everything okay, and else you need to have complicated I, I, well, well, I don't know if you're noticing all the questions that you're making, like, okay, how, how do I put it as a, as a child? Okay, how do I know which tab? How do I actually answer? Th those little questions make it not worth doing that. And so I would argue that it is easier to just hide and show. That would be easier because anybody can do that. Now, if you are going that route, which I would do personally because I like to learn those kind of stuff, even if I don't never use it, I would be able to answer somebody if they ask me. In that sense, um, if I go that route, the route that I would go is either the DLL calls or the messages. Those are the two options that you have. Auto hotkey by itself does not have a very easy way to deal with those kind of things. So I would go and search for the Windows 32 API because very likely there is an API call that allows you to do that. Uh, at least assign it to a specific tab. And after that, you would have to move it yourself. You know, There might be something like that. I, I was just thinking about something. I think you have a DDL call to request the parent of a control. Yes. So I could make an edit in the tab and then ask what is the parent of this, this edit? And then but, use but, that but again, idea of the parent to connect the other uh, edits. <laughs> right, but here's the deal. Again, remember each tab, and this is the, the part that not many people understand. Each tab is actually a button. They are buttons. Okay, so it might be, and I'm not really sure about this, the whole tab control has a handle, but each tab has a handle by itself because it is a button. So if you want, uh, and the button itself has a handle and the panel below it has a handle. So what you want to do is grab the edit control, make it a child of the, of the panel that is below that button. Mm -hmm. So if you do that, then you don't have to worry about hiding a show because it's already done. So that's what my guess would be. But as I'm not sure how the tab control was built, I cannot really assure you, yes, it is that the tab has a handle and the panel has a handle. And the, that's just my guess. Um, and, and what you're asking for is something that I have never done myself. And if I would have done that, what I would do is just do whatever you're doing right now. I would just hide it, duplicate the controls. It is way easier. And you're saying like, well, but a list view is more different. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing on the script that I just showed you. I have two different list views and they work exactly the same. They call exactly the same functions, but 
with the if you want at the end of the webinar we're going to take a little time and i would show you how i'm doing it so that you can see how easy it is it's not that it's not as hard as you think it is even if it is a list view you know okay but still i think i i um I will try to see if it's possible. Just put edit always on top because then yes. you could hide and show and, and move it. That would be another ID. Uh, yeah, because I really is. don't like the mirror thing because I want to add some ex, uh, advanced uh, yeah. uh, events to it. So then again, again, everything. My, my point would be you asked if that was easy. What you're referring to right now is not easy. You're going to have to do a lot of manual work, and that is going to take you way more time than just, just hiding and showing. <laughs> that, that's, what, that's the only thing that I'm going to say. <laughs> it doesn't mean in the long run it wouldn't pay off, right? No, it that's would true. pay off, right? Yeah, of course. And, and you would learn a lot of cool stuff along the way, of course. That's not what I'm saying. But just in the context of the question that you made, like, like what you're describing right now, that would be the, the, the more expensive approach. That's what I would say. <laughs> okay. Um, I have another comment. Uh, last webinar, I asked a question regarding uh, uh, Outlook. And uh, currently, it's solved on the forum. If somebody is interested, I can show it. Uh... Yeah, I, I asked if anyone else had any other questions. I didn't see anybody someone chime in. And actually, someone commented on one of the videos. And they're like, hey, can I get that script? And I'm like, well, in, you know, in that webinar, Isaiah, I think it was Isaiah, or maybe it was Jackie and I both said, we don't work with things in line like that. So we don't have a working solution. And I, and it was your script. So anyway, if, yeah, go ahead and share um, whatever you want to share. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and show that. Yeah, okay. You, you know, the other thing is, given more and more people are having like 4K monitors, I think people might start working like how you're doing it, right? Because you have the land, uh, the, the size for it. Did, but did anyone else have any, uh, any other questions? Um, hopefully some that, that us lower level people can handle. Because <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay. No, like, um, that's the question, like, because usually when we deal with other, this kind of scripts that we're doing at the moment, like, um, there's a lot of uh, things that get very complicated very quickly, right? So, and when we go ahead and look for solutions, then you get these kind of things like what he's showing right now. So they're not like easy solutions to understand, right? <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so, so this is actually the, the function that you could use to uh, add uh, an attachment to the active file and with the, the active mail, actually. So if you, if you have, uh, do I have Outlook here? I think so. But it's the uh, active explorer dot active inline response is what I think is the. Yes. So my intention, I will repeat what my intention was. Um, so if you reply on something, then you get this window. And my mm -hmm. intention was to have a hotkey that, to add uh, a attachment to that window. So first you need to connect in some way or another to. Oh, he got, he got muted. Um, Dimitri, you got muted. I think yeah. I muted him. Sorry. I was clicking yeah. a bit. Um, there and I think maybe you, did you add him as AS? And right when I went to hit admit, it disappeared. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Dimitri I did. Was I did. There and it muted them. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. I did. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so my idea was um, I send a lot of mails. And if I um, generate documents, a lot of them are PDFs. I have a help key for it, and they always go in the same folder. So if mm -hmm. I need to find that folder, it's always the same. And I have also a hot key for that folder to open that. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a lot of cases, you want to send uh, the latest uh, PDF that I generated. 
So then I just make a, a, a menu for it with the five latest PDFs that are generated. And I use that function to, to add it to the active. Go ahead and add it. Now, now that's the interesting thing. Um, uh, if you show the script again, please, uh, the solution to the... Now, one of the things that I usually, um, I myself try to always avoid, and I think is the best when people just simply avoid this kind of things is that it says, if active window class 34, or if active window class 35. Now, what does 34 mean? And what does 35 mean? So that is always good to, if you have these kind of numbers like that, that make absolutely, we're talking about an active window, right? So it should be something. It's better to either make a variable that has those numbers and just put it there or just put a comment right next to it as to what that is. So I'm now very curious as to what those classes are. What what, what does those two numbers represent in here? I think uh, a lot of Microsoft uh, programs have numbers uh, related to, yeah. Yeah, they're built yeah, in constants. Yeah, sure. It's the same with Excel and uh, Word. They have indeed uh, numbers that recommend represent certain states, and you can find them on the internet. <laughs> well, no, no, but it's just saying if he had done this, he would have inserted the actual right. If I, if I, if I, yeah, if yeah, I, if I had it, written that right, yeah. yeah, so that when when somebody else tries to fix this or tries right. to understand it, in your case, you just copy pasted it. But if it stops working tomorrow, you will have no clue what the heck happened. Like, why is thirty five or why is thirty four? Right well, now, and, and let's it, say in a year or two, suddenly it disappears, and you can no longer easily look it up. That's right. where having it documented here. Just yeah, it, it would actually help. No, no. And we're not it, picking it, on you, Dimitri. No, no, no. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just like I'm just trying. Now I got curious. Like, okay, so he's actually checking on those two classes, but what are those two classes and why? You know. And, <laughs> and what I I want to do is just take a quick step backwards before we jump into this and say, a lot of people will see, especially on the forum, you know, or in Facebook. Hey, I'm trying to automate Outlook, and they're sending mouse clicks. Right. And it's like Outlook, you know, has calm, has especially so Outlook really. has a crazy object model with so much functionality. It is a bit overwhelming, honestly, with Outlook because there's so much going on there. But you can basically do what you know, programmatically do whatever you want. Right. And it's just it is so robust and reliable and fast. Um, it's just it's awesome. It doesn't mean the other way, setting keystrokes and stuff. Is is quote quote unquote wrong, but no, it it it, it, it has not. its time. It, it has its right. time and place, right? right? There are certain situations in you in which you want to send keystrokes, but so long as there is a way for you to, to automate the stuff without having to send input, that would be you know it would make your life better in the long run. It is easier to write, but it is harder to debug. That's what happens. That's what going. Yeah. That's what's going on. That's yeah. true. I quickly made a, a function to um, just see the class. So here okay, I so the current to class. the Outlook application, and then I will uh, display here in my debug window uh, the class. Yeah. So if I press F12. That would return so a number. I would, I would assume that that would return a number. Yeah, it will normally return a, a number. Right. Loading. You see here at the currently it's 34. 34 right? That but if you, for example, do not have any um, uh, in attachment, if you have a normal mail open, right? It's also 34. Okay. Right. That's interesting. You see what I mean? Now you're you're kind of understanding what I'm saying. Like now, okay. Like what does that mean? Can it, maybe when you're creating a mail, yeah. When you're well, not not there. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's 35. 35 on a new mail. Okay, and 34 on, yeah. So that's what I would, that's what, on 34 on an, on an existing mail and 35 on a new mail. Maybe that's the idea behind it, right? Yeah. yeah. Because the side effect of that function is that you can also add attachment to mails that you're not editing. Mm. 
Sorry, what that's was that? actually something that I do a lot in, in my work, but then most of the time I edit the, the subjects because we work with the project numbers and a lot of I get a lot of mails. And to organize them, I just add the project number to the subject, and then I know what project it is. Right. You can easily find and, and search for it. Right. That's yeah. awesome. So you're basically tagging them in a, in a sense, right? To, yeah. make it, to filter yes. out. Basically, that's what he's saying. Yeah. And actually, another uh, method that I use that is quite of interesting, if a, if a new mail comes in, I automatically add a flag to it like this. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a search uh, folder that just displays all the mails that are flagged. And you all, I always need to uh, put them completed. So uh, yeah, I do not use this computer with Outlook. <laughs> Normally you can indicate that it's completed. I know. This is sent messages. So yeah, maybe here. Yeah, you can. Ah, oh, that's different here. Yeah, there's a different version of the, the Outlook that I use on my job. Uh, uh, then you can set it to complete it and then I just need to set all the mails to complete it, but, but then I know I have read it and I do not need to look at it anymore. It's normally finished. Yeah. And that's my way to, to organize my mails. And then I have a, a, a search function then that just collects all the mails that are still flagged. And you do not need to see the, the emails that are completed. Yeah, awesome. So several years ago, uh, I was helping my real estate agent and she she paid to get um, run ads on, what was it called? Um, Zillow. And she'd get referrals and people would write her and basically say, hey, is this property still available? And she's like, you don't understand how much of my time. I take this email. It's in the standard format. I have to get it, look up the address write them back. Usually it's not available and all the stuff. And I said, I could, I could automate that whole stuff. So we made it where basically you could highlight a bunch of emails, hit a button. It would loop through it because the structure of the email was all the same, you know, because it was coming from a form. I mean, it very, very easy. Um, and so we would go through and automate, look into the MLS and look up the property, see if it's available. If it's not, it would say, but, you know, write a reply to them. It's not available, but I can help you find something else. If it was, it would actually pull in some of the information for them and, and write a different response. But that was all done with Calm, with using uh, Outlook, because she was using Outlook. Um, and it saved her so much time. Uh, and it was very, fairly complicated, I should say. But we've done a lot of stuff with Outlook. It's amazing. Yeah, I have something similar. Um, we have uh, project folders at our company. And um, if I go into a project folder and I put, uh, select some files, then I can, uh, I, I, I use a lot of uh, menus. I always generate a menu. I have one hotkey that generates the menu and the menu is dependent on which program is open and what is selected. So he yep. takes uh, the clipboard and he, he checks what you have selected. And depending on that, he will generate a menu with all the possible useful commands. And one of that command is uh, send an email. And what he actually does, he, he generates a mail with at, as a subject, it's the project number with the name of the project. Yeah, and then he will tell the uh, project leader uh, that I've put some files into the project folder and uh, the links are also quite put in, in that mail. Uh, so that saved me a lot of time because, yeah. yeah. So I was on a call with Maestri today. We had, we had this client and uh, the lady, you know, that works at the company, she is, She's, she's a little bit older than me, you know, not techie in any way. And we were talking, going through the project and what part she got stuck. Cause she's like, you don't, she's like, you know, I'm having a problem understanding this because 
she's so used to doing everything manually and she's trying to learn. And I said, you know, it's, it's just a shifting in your mindset. Once you start thinking like a programmer, you start realizing how easy it is to do a bunch of other things you have available, right? And like your menus that are context sensitive, detect what program you're in and make different things available. It's such a tiny little thing. And yet it's so powerful, right? It's, it's just amazing. Yes, it, it is. Usually when you when you start thinking like a programmer, what happens is what is happening to Dimitri with the previous question is like, isn't it easier if I just move the control into this? Like he's already thinking like right. there has to be a better right. way. And that is the that is exactly the mindset of any programmer. There has to be an easier way. There has to be a better way. Let's just. Uh, make it a little bit more efficient here uh, you know and after one gets into the loop on that everything you look at okay isn't that better if I do it this way okay hold on isn't that better if I just do it that other way <laughs> yeah. and, and, and you know you and I as yes, we've talked a lot about this of like there's always a better way right yes it's, do you have the time and does it uh does it deserve you know the amount of energy it's going to take and time this and that in a lot of time you know in the long run it will pay out but you know when you have things that are you need to deliver on right like that's that you got to walk that thin line of um, being able to still get work done get paid um and you know not go crazy right um in our case i do understand that a lot of times uh it is easy to just go and do something that works and then just leave it at that. But um, there's a lot of times that it, just for your own sake, especially if there are projects that you're going to maintain over a period of, of time, right? Say, for example, one year, two years. Um, if you write the stuff just for it to work right now, later on, it's going to be so hard to maintain. It's going to be so hard to figure out how to fix. But if you just make something that works after you know that it's working then let's change this code to make it a little bit more readable let's change this other code to make it more efficient and then in the end you have this compact thing that down the road whenever you have to change something you don't have to modify the whole thing it's just that one line right uh, is part of the mindset part of yeah. the programmer's mindset as well I believe, and man, I'm, I must be losing my mind, but I think Jack and I did a podcast not too long ago on how important refactoring is, right? And when you refactor it, there's so many benefits to it, but it's it's hard to take the time to do it, right? But refactor just, you go back over your code and kind of optimize it and study it. And that's how, A, you have some really great learnings when you start doing this. And, you know, the other really big one is like a psychological feeling like I actually achieved something because... Um, you look at what how you used to do things, right? You're like, oh, what was I thinking? You know, like now I've I've grown, right? And unless you do that, it's really hard to to notice those things, right? But um, yeah, it's it's a great way to kind of make big jumps forward. Um, but you got to take time and slow down and and go back to your old stuff to do that. That's right. Um, I actually I uh, I had the same example uh, this week. Uh, I actually made a, a JavaScript code to collect some information from a web page. And it was uh, quite complicated and a loop inside a loop. And it was really hard to follow. I, I copied it from the internet and I studied and, and tweaked it so it, it would work for me. And then a few days ago, I found a, a small code and yeah, you can just use that. <laughs> 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 yeah, you could just do this instead, right? Yeah, but that, and then that you get was the feeling. The guy who, yeah. I'm quite smart to figure the other way out, but I'm quite stupid that I, <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't figure out something uh, uh, a little bit that more uh, more simple, right? But but here's the deal: that simple, that one simple expression that you got that did the job. It is not that easy to come up with that. OK, it is the same as and this is something that I understand uh, as a teach as I have been a teacher for other stuff. I was teaching uh, languages before. And one of the things that I actually kind of like understood and it got root into my brain is if you cannot explain it in a simple way it's because you do not understand it. So when you create code that is convoluted, it's because you're just thinking it through. That's OK. That's fine then take the time to go ahead and make it more simple. 
when you do that, you will really understand your code. Okay, you will really get it. And then that guy that gave you that answer, that is a very simple answer, that was not easy. It looks simple, but it is not easy. It's never easy. <laughs> it might be more complicated than the convoluted answer you got at the beginning, you know? <laughs> no, it, it was actually quite easy because it was just a JavaScript function that existed, but I didn't knew that it existed. So, yeah. No, but I, I've been that way, especially we're both working with, with well, with Isaiah's, with Jackie and Maestrieth. Maestrieth using objects, he'll do stuff that just blows me away. And then, you know, but the thing is, he's done them for foundation level, like understanding and grasping of data structures that it's, you know, it's just, it's awesome to watch and see someone take your project and level it up. And that's why I highly encourage you guys to find someone that's a little bit higher than you, ask them to review your code with you. And that's when you really start learning, right? When someone takes your code, that specific example that you worked on and then optimizes it in a way, and it's so much easier to learn from because you're familiar with what the goal is, what's going on, how it was done. And it's some really big ahas. It's so much easier to learn. I think, I think that's the, you just uh, dived into a very important point, the intent what the programmer was trying to do at that time matters a lot. And what happens is that one year later, that intent gets hidden. Nobody knows what it was. You have to figure it out. If your code is in a way that is not structured or it is just something that you coded very quickly, that intent is gonna be impossible to read from the outside view. That's the reason, I don't know if you noticed, Dimitri, as soon as I saw the code, I said like, okay, what is that 34? What is that 35? What was the intent in there? What was he trying to do? Why does he have a, an if statement right there? That's the part that I'm always after. What did you try to do? If I can get your intent very quickly, I would say you're a very good programmer. Uh, well, you just made like 5,000 lines of code, but they are easy to read. Awesome. Now you go to the forums and you find a two-liner that even the guy doesn't understand it. And I'm like, that's really bad code. Oh, but it's efficient. It's cool. It's great. No, I cannot understand it. Nobody can understand it. It's not well, good. <laughs> you know, uh, as a, as that, um, and I think what you're just saying here too, like you, you mentioned it, but earlier you and I were on a call and we were talking about instead of just storing the variable, uh, I'm sorry, using it directly, you created a variable just so you could basically you know, have that value and help convey what's going on, right? We I, could have hidden the whole thing. I think it was in the stir split thing. That right, we're doing. right, right, right. So but I could you show you. It out. Yeah, I could show you. So here's the, let me show my screen for a second. Yeah, so, so, And I, I think the main right. point though is just because something is efficient isn't necessarily always best, right? If you got to come back to it later and try to read it and Especially... have to struggle to understand it. Now, what we're referring to right now, let me just go ahead and see if I could um, make sure. If I had more time, I would have given a shorter letter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is, I, it is I've true. I've read that one before, Geek Dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, let me, let me see if I could make this a little bit bigger. Where's my hotkeys? Uh -huh, there we are. I was telling so his I'm helping a local restaurant with their marketing and they, they speak mostly Spanish. They don't speak English. And it's, it's actually been a really good exercise for me because I have to simplify what I'm trying Whatever to do. You're saying. Make it very simple. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So we have here line 157. Okay. Now what happens with this particular line, as you can see, I'm doing a string split on a loop field. And I'm just grabbing the first part of that string. Now, I could just grab this and put it right here. Oh, yeah, it's very, very uh, efficient. You know, it's very cool code. But the problem is, if I give you that code, you will have no idea what the heck is going on unless you have the tools to actually stop the script in the middle of running and seeing what the A loop field has at that particular point, okay? So the other one was really it would make it so difficult for you to actually go ahead and, um, um, it, it makes it so hard for you to understand what the intent was. 
but I can do it. I know that people like to do those kind of things, but I instead wanted to make it very straightforward. And now anybody who reads my code would see that that is a command that should be there. See? Now, even if you don't know what the structure of the code is or what it's doing, well, at least I know that that's a command, okay? Now, one thing that I um, learned, and uh, I remember, I think, Joe, I, I sent you that, uh, that uh, was kind of like a workshop. It was uh, two hours, six lessons of two hours each. I remember that? It was kind of like a workshop, a one-week workshop. Somebody talking about clean code. Mm. Wow. One of the things that he mentioned was, you know, your variable names, how long should they be? That's one of the debates, you know. What they say is that the if you do not have to use this uh, variable very far away, like in your code, that you don't have to scroll too long to find them, they can be very short, okay? I could just put here CMD. That makes sense, okay? Now, if I would have to scroll a few thousand lines and find CMD by itself, I would not know what the hell is, what, why it is, what it is, or what the context, the context is. So then I would need to add more context to it. Like, um, this is the, the, the result, uh, result command or something like that, that gives me a little bit of context of what that command is or something like that. You don't you know? have to go look it up. Then I don't have to go ahead and go back and look it up. You know, in my case, I rather have, um, usually I go for one word variables. I try to stay within this green line. So my code does not go too far to the right so that I don't have to read too much, but with one word variables, um, you take a little bit of space, but it is clear what you're trying to do. If I give you this code, doesn't matter in this group, most of the people in here, if I give this code to anybody here and something breaks, I think they might be able to solve it fairly quickly because it's not going to be that hard to understand what is going on. You know, that's the main idea of um, clean code. Uh, For those... In, in the <laughs> Read the uh, the chat. Geek could made a really good. He said, code, "Code's written once and read many times. Write it for that understanding. Code is written for the reader. If, when executed, it behaves as intended, then consider it a happy accident." Ha <laughs> ha. But <laughs> it's true. Yeah, good point. Uh, Geek good is it, it, it's. You know, and actually, remember that I gotta find that link and share it. Uh, the you know you're a programmer when like remember that that guy. Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was really funny because it's like basically he's he interviews himself right he pretends that he's a programmer and, and he's pretends he's both sides and he's the manager and the programmer he's like hey we want you to create that app and basically he's like i'm i'm not creating no app you don't need an app about you know and this is how programmers are um and sometimes they just want to prove how smart they are right they write things so complicated and you've seen some people do this right they purposely like make them so complicated and go wow look at what i did but no yeah. mere mortal can actually understand what they did. So it kind of defeats the purpose, right? But anyway, yeah. yeah. Right here, I just went ahead and tried to figure this function out. Just go ahead and try it, you know? <laughs> right. I just copy pasted right. it and I'm not gonna even try. Now, right. what I know is if it breaks, I'm screwed, right. <laughs> you know? Like <laughs> I was having some, uh, oh, the first time we were having a, a, a little bit of an issue of, uh, how the Liebenstein distance was being calculated. And the first thing I did was go online and find that function online to verify if it was the function that was working wrong, because I was not gonna read the function. I right. do not want to read it. I don't want to do anything with it. You know, that's the problem with it, um, with, with writing code like that. Um, in my case, I just have here a line that does nothing more than assigning a variable from the result scores to the best result. And I'm gonna regex match on the best result something that is a URL. I, I think nobody's gonna uh, feel threatened <laughs> to try to fix that. If you need to fix what the best score was, then the first thing is that you have to check what the best result was. It's gonna be easy for you to figure out where to start. You know, I think that's, uh, it makes a little bit more code because now it's two lines but it helps me in the end. 
three years from now, when I take a look at this code, I'm not going to be lost. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how many of you have had the experience of looking at your own code from one, two, oh, three, percent. five months ago, and you're right. like, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's how it, it is. To add on, uh, Geek Dude, or especially this part where he says, when I worked as a software developer, we were not allowed to use abbreviations in variable names for that exact reason. Uh, that That is really fascinating. Um, thanks for that insight, Geek Dude, because obviously I'm not a programmer. Uh, but it's really interesting to see that programmers purposely don't, you know, or at least some of them purposely don't do that or allow that. Or, uh, uh, Dylan says that he gets lost the next day. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, it is part of the learning curve, right? So I, I grab some code that Lexicos write, and I'm going to be lost as, as exactly the same as you are. So <laughs> because he writes code in a very different way, and I'm not going to be uh, 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 understanding that as easily as if it is somebody on my level, right? It, um, does anyone else have something they want to share or, or something they're stuck on? Actually, let me go ahead. I'm well. Actually, let, uh, if if not, I guess we're done. Unless we have something we're going to cover. But I was going to say I'll stop recording and start again. But depends on that. Depends on whether you want me to show a little bit of the stuff that we're working on. Okay, hold on. Let me let me stop the recording. I'll restart it since we're past the hour. <laughs>